So, uh, in 2012, uh, in the final year of my five-year architecture degree program, when I was pretty sure I was going to be a professional architect, I saw two videos that would end up changing my life entirely. The first one was the Oculus Kickstarter video, and the second one was the first Leap Motion demo. Um, I would show both those videos to anybody who would watch them, rambling about how if these were real technologies, if they weren't just gimmicks, we were about to have matrix-like technology in our lifetimes. I would talk to my architecture friends and tell them computing is about to become spatial, and they would just nod along, sort of humoring me. It wasn't until I got my first uh, headset, an Oculus DK1, that I started really evangelizing and converting my friends to the promise of VR. Then a little while later, I go to DK2, and slowly over evenings and weekends, through YouTube tutorials, I started to make things in Unity, uh, like this experience, uh, Weightless. Um, they were digital things, yes, but they didn't seem digital anymore. They didn't seem physical yet either, but the line had started to blur. They were spatial, at the very least. They started to feel volumetric. I could model something on my computer the same way I had many times in architecture school, but now it wasn't bound to the 2D screen. I could put on a headset and walk around it in 3D, experiencing it visually like I would experience any other three-dimensional object. And with a leap motion mounted to the headset, I could reach out and touch the objects, and they would react the same way a real object would. My definitions of physical and digital had started to collapse in on each other. In spaces, I could step into my architectural designs and experience them as though they'd actually been built. The enormous gap between designing something on a screen and the physical three-dimensional spatial experience it was trying to convey had completely dissolved. In terms of visual perception, they were now one and the same. Even with my surface-level understanding of game engines, physics simulations, and rendering pipelines, it didn't change the profound experiences that I could have, create, and share with others. And so for the last two and a half years, that's what I've been doing as a virtual reality designer, developer, and evangelist at Leap Motion, where we're working on technology that brings your hands into virtual reality directly without the intermediary of controllers or gloves. And we're only just starting to scratch the surface. VR, AR, and MR are going to involve many, many other fields because we are essentially mixing our real reality with a completely synthetic designed one. But today, I want to focus mainly on the convergence of two fields which I think have always, in my mind, been very separate. Physical 3D design and personal computing. The long history of humans shaping, forming, and molding the world into form and space to serve their needs, and on the other side, the relatively short but equally important history of the digital world, which has been connecting and empowering us over the last 40 years or longer until today when they permeate almost every aspect of our daily lives. As these worlds wash over one another, it will be difficult to tell them apart, to tease them aside. And in some ways, that has already happened. But until now, the digital world has been clearly separated, sealed behind the screens of our devices, but not for much longer. As the current paradigm of mobile computing has been defined by our ability to move around with our devices, I think the coming paradigm of spatial computing will be defined by our ability to use the space around us as a medium to interact with technology. In space, space is the native medium of human interaction. We've evolved as three-dimensional creatures operating in a three-dimensional world who channel information in from our senses to create mental spatial models that help us understand where we are, where other things are, where we want to go, and how to get there. Technologies which tap into this innate human ability to create mental spatial models are easier to use and quicker, easier to use and quicker to learn because they require less cognitive load from the user. History shows that at every technological step in our relationship to computers, making human computer interaction more like human real world interaction, that is minimizing abstraction, has made, has made these technologies more adopted and more accessible. In their book, The Fourth Transformation, Robert Scoble and Shell Israel lay out computing has, as having gone through three transformations so far. Computing started with m big mainframes that specially trained people inserted punch cards into in order to interact with them. Then in the 70s, text input and the keyboard let people type real words into computers that define commands, allowing many more people to use them. 
In the 80s, the graphical user interface and the window, Windows icons, menus, and pointers combined with the mouse allowed even more people to use computers in their daily lives. And then in 2007, with the launch of the iPhone, the uh, touch interface and portable screens in our pockets became the dominant computing paradigm. At each step, we've seen that making computer, human computer interaction more like human real world interaction has made it easier to use computers. And touchscreens in particular brought us a huge step closer to minimizing abstraction in hu human computer interaction. It has increased the accessibility of computers so that 40 years ago, someone needed extensive training to learn the completely abstract language of punch cards in order to interact with the computer to interfaces that even, that even a toddler or grandparents can just pick up and use. Now in 2017, we're moving into the fourth transformation, led by VR, AR, and MR as we move into spatial computing. And as with each previous transformation, as the output transforms from screens in our pockets to wearable devices projecting three-dimensional images into our eyes, so too will the input transform. The thing we'll use to interact with this new spatial output, its other half, is spatial input from our bodies. As the keyboard was to text input, as the mouse was to windows, icons, menus, and pointers, and as our fingers are to the screens in our pockets, so too are our bodies to the space around us. And so it seems logical that uh, the same way that we interact with the physical world will be how we interact with these new spatial computing platforms. During this fourth transformation, I think we're going to see a lot more sensors that are able to track our bodies at much higher fidelities than we've seen before. From hand tracking to eye tracking to mouth tracking to face tracking to body tracking to brainwave tracking, heart rate tracking, and on and on, our bodies are capable of a very wide spectrum of actions, from the incredibly subtle ones, like the saccadic movement of our eyes, to fully engaged ones, like when we play an intense sport. But when we look at input in mainstream computing so far, uh, from text input, mouse input, and touch input, we can see that each is primarily binary. Either we're pressing a key, we're clicking a mouse, or we're touching a screen, or we're not. And the possible input combinations for these systems are those binary states multiplied by more of them, by how long we're doing it for, and in the case of the touch screen and the mouse, where in two dimensions we are and if we're moving. 3D human-computer interaction is almost as old as computing itself. But up until recently, most of these devices have remained in the domain of research labs or specialized medical and engineering applications, failing to break into mainstream computing. Today, because of the rise of spatial computing as a true 3D output, the resulting market demand for a suitably complementary input, and advances in a bunch of fields like cameras, lasers, computer vision, machine learning, and so on, we're seeing systems that are capable of tracking a 3D point in space at very high accuracy with very low latency at consumer prices. Two examples which I'm sure we're all aware of are the Oculus Constellation system and HTC's uh, OVIVES, sorry, Lighthouse system. These systems combine uh, the actuating buttons and swipes of instrument input with the tracking of a point in three-dimensional space. And looking out a few years into the future for home gaming and studio enterprise, u enterprise use, arcades and other specific location locked use cases, these systems which use an external computer and external sensors to track controllers or wearable markers will continue to provide stable three-dimensional three -dimensional tracking but at the cost of a lack of mobility. For mass mainstream adoption of spatial computing platforms, especially AR, which will all be mobile and will eventually replace our smartphones, these systems will need to become all-in-one devices. Capa they will need to shrink and become all-in-one devices, capable of tracking not just objects manipulated by our bodies, but our bodies themselves directly. And the first of these devices are already on the market, from ODG's R9, Microsoft's HoloLens, uh, Meta's Meta2, and many, many more are in the works and on the way. And the touchless sensing technologies that are going to power these devices are already pretty advanced. Um, this is a demo I finished a couple of weeks ago called Mirrors. Um, the focus of this demo, I wanted to get across a sense of body presence and a sense of the rich interaction that's possible when you track your body at a really high fidelity. Um, so you can see it's basically real-time motion capture happening from the leap motion that's mounted on, on the top of the headset there. 
at Leap, we track your hands as 26 individual data points with position and orientation. So it's a full hand skeleton. It's not a depth cloud or some sort of approximation. It's literally your skeleton being pulled into the virtual world with you. And once we know where your hands are, you get, you, if we move to the next slide, once we know where your hands are, you can begin to have these incredibly subtle, nuanced, physical-like interactions with virtual objects. This is another demo I made called uh, Geometric, where the focus was on finger scale rigid body interactions. When I put people in this demo for the first time, they normally start out by making really big arm gestures because they're probably used to systems that track at a lower fidelity or at a bigger scale so that your hand is actually just one tracking point. But after a little while, they realize that they actually have the full articulation of their fingers and they start poking and flicking and tapping. And in a way, they look like toddlers rediscovering physics for the first time because in a sense, they are. And hand tracking is just the beginning. Eye tracking offers an even su more subtle level of input, one which we're often not even aware of. Similarly, face and expression tracking, uh, popularized at the moment by Snapchat on just the camera on your phone, will bring even more data from our bodies into these spatial computing applications. And I think in the next few years, we're going to see more and more of this with biometric information from your heart, from your brain, uh, everything just being fed into these systems as we move towards having your body fully transported into a virtual space with you. But back to today. Now that we're able to track your hands directly in 3D, the question becomes what kind of three-dimensional interfaces are we going to be using in these spatial computing applications? I think just as the short but deep history of two-dimensional user interface design on web, mobile, and uh, desktop has drawn deeply from the longer history of uh, graphic design, typography, and motion graphics, we're going to see spatial computing designers of the future drawing from architecture and industrial design, design as the foundation of their practice. And in the longer version of this talk, I go into a bit more deeper on architecture and industrial design, but because we don't have much time, I'm just going to summarize the points from those. So architecture, when most people think about architecture, they think about an iconic building or style or materials or structures or even an architect themselves. And while those are all important parts of architecture, the core thing, the reason for it all, is to define space. Because it is not the concrete or the wood or the glass or the steel in a building that we as humans can actually use and occupy. It is the space that those things define. Architecture then is the study of how humans perceive and experience space and how the design of spaces can fulfill specific needs. And the feeling of a space can be affected by many, many things. But five very quick and <laughs> good things to remember if you're designing a virtual space or a real one are form and space, two sides of the same coin. Form defines space, space defines form. By defining one, you're defining the other. In virtual spaces, it's really interesting because form isn't even really a thing. You could put your head through a wall, and there's a whole weird implications that come out of that. Light. So a space is only experienced mainly through the light that bounces ar around it. So you change the lighting in a room, you change the, r the experience of the room dramatically. Scale. Uh, architecture. Humans are a certain size. Architecture can either concede to that scale and make it feel warm and inviting as though it was designed for humans, or on the other end of the scale, not a pun that was intended, uh, you could be ignorant, you could ignore the size of an individual and make the space feel monumental and indifferent to, the, to a single person. Similarly, organization can make, a sp make certain parts of a space feel really important while other parts feel secondary, or it can, it can imply movement by having repetition or direction. Lastly, materiality can massively change the feeling of a space. And I think in, in virtual spaces, we're starting to see some really interesting stuff with virtual materials, things that are native to virtual reality or augmented reality that we couldn't have in the real world. It's also super interesting. On the industrial design side, um, almost every object that we interact with in our daily lives has been formed under three big sort of constraints. Serving a physical function under physical constraints with good ergonomics. That's, if you think about a spoon, it's for scooping and stirring. How thick is its handle? It has physical constraints it, which it needs to serve. How th should the handle be shaped so a human can hold it? When we move into virtual object design, however, skipping past all this skeuomorphic stuff, when we move into virtual object design, uh, things get a little bit stranger because we don't have those constraints anymore. So what 
should we take from industrial design and bring into virtual uh, object design? One thing I think is really important is affordances. Affordances are the possibility of an action upon an item that is communicated to a user through its shape. So a button might afford the action of being pushed because it has, it has a rounded top. A, a switch might afford the action of being toggled because it has the switch on, on the hinge so you can tell sort of how to, how to use it. I think uh, affordances are a really important thing that give visual cues to a user on how to begin an interaction, even if at the moment it's all just someone waving their hand in the air. I think the challenge is to make users feel familiar in a new environment, for interactions to feel intuitive, but then to flip their expectations and let them do something that they could only do in virtual reality. Interactions that feel both natural and supernatural all at once. And that's a pretty hard thing to do, but um, in the next 50 seconds, and then we're going to jump off the stage, we're going to quickly run through a bunch of examples. So uh, we're seeing some really cool things. Dynamic scaling, being able to scale the world down or the user up and give them a sense of scale, which you can only do when you're fully immersed in a virtual experience. Uh, playing with scale, being able to jump from a giant's view down into being inside a model or carving a mountain around you as you're manipulating a model. Dynamic spaces, so instead of actually moving the person, you could move the world around them and have them move that way. Uh, impossible spaces, spaces that are bigger on the inside than they appear from the outside. Drawers, which go on forever, and you can store as many things as you want in there. Uh, objects that become spaces, so that you can carry spaces around with you and share them with others. Uh, object non-permanence, if you look at something, you look away, and when you look back, it's completely changed. Just messing with things that we take for granted in the real world. Infinite inventories, the same sort of idea, being able to pull as many things as you want out of an infinite backpack, like in Fantastic Contraption. Uh, holographic interfaces that are there when you want them and gone when you don't need them anymore. Uh, and like when I was showing the uh, three-dimensional input, uh, human computer input uh, devices, now in virtual spaces, we can just create those so that you can pull them up when you need them and have them disappear when you are done with them. And the very last one, uh, oh, second last one, virtual wearables, attaching things to the body so that you can have uh, interfaces which pop up when you need them and go away when you don't. And then the last one uh, is virtual materials where... Uh, Walls can be made of liquid metal or react to your hands in ways that we could never have in the real world. Um, overall, I don't know how these things are going to evolve, uh, but that's what I find so exciting about it. Um, I hope you got some of that excitement too. Thanks.